Hi, I'm Ned, and I make games. In this video, I'm wrapping up my series on mip maps by investigating how shaders choose which mip map level to draw, and how you can influence that. Make sure that you watch the videos on mip map settings and the partial derivative functions, as we'll use both here. To catch up, mip maps are smaller versions of textures that Unity generates, which look and perform better when a texture shrinks on the screen. When you sample a texture using the Sample Texture 2D Macro or the Shader Graph node, the function computes the best MIP level to render automatically behind the scenes. What is this best MIP map? Ideally, it's where one screen pixel contains one texture pixel. There is a way that you can bypass this MIP map choice algorithm and manually choose a MIP map level, the Sample Texture 2D LOD Macro or Shader Graph node. Just pass the MIP level as the LOD argument Using this tool, let's recreate the mipmap choice algorithm and really learn how it works. Hidden in the core render pipeline shader library is this function, compute texture LOD, Unity's re-implementation of the mipmap choosing algorithm. It's a lot to take in at once, so let's create a simple shader to test it all out. Start with this, which passes a scaled UV to the fragment stage and draws the main texture. Note the underscore main text property, which holds the texture, and its corresponding texture, sampler, and scale and offset vector variables. Call compute texture LOD in the fragment function. First, pass the UV. The next argument is something called the texel size. This terminology is a little confusing. Normally a texel refers to a pixel on the texture, and texel size is the size of one texel in UV space which is 1 divided by the texture dimensions. However, Unity uses it here to refer to the entire texture's dimensions. Regardless, you can get both values using this magic variable. If you name a variable texture name underscore texel size, Unity automatically fills it so that the xy values contain the size of one texel in UV space, and the zw values contain the dimensions of the texture. So, pass the zw components to compute texture LOD. Okay, the last argument is a MIP bias. This value causes the renderer to pick a higher or lower MIP map value than strictly called for. I'll go into this in much more detail soon, but for now, just add a property and a corresponding variable for it, and then pass it as a last argument to compute texture LOD. Finally, sample main text using sample texture 2D LOD, passing the MIP level. Back in Unity, Things look about how we'd expect. Try adjusting the MIP map bias to preview different MIP levels. Now that we have a handle on its arguments, let's recreate Compute Texture LOD ourselves. Remember the goal of this algorithm is to make it so that one texture pixel is the same size as one screen pixel. So our first objective is to find out how many texture pixels are in one screen pixel. This sounds like a job for DDX and DDY. Multiply the UV by the texture size to unnormalize it. It now points to a texture pixel by the row and column index. Passing this to the partial derivative functions yields the amount of texels the shader moves over when it draws a single pixel. This is at MIP map level 0. Now we need to figure out which MIP map level will bring these values closest to 1. To simplify things, combine everything into a single float. Calculate each derivative vector's dot product with itself to compute its squared length, and then take the maximum of that. Now, remember each MIP level is half the dimensions of the previous level, meaning it has half the texels in the same screen area. Our D variable holds the approximate number of texels in this screen pixel, squared. The base2 logarithm computes how many times we can half this value to get as close to 1 as possible. The number of halves is also the MIP level. Alright, so what's this one half for? Remember that d is the max partial derivative length squared, so we need to take its square root. The square root function is slow, but thankfully n times log x equals log x to the nth power, so multiplying by one half is the same as taking the square root. Finally, add the bias and make sure that the level is never less than zero, and we're golden. 
Moving back into Unity, compare this shader with a default shader, and it's pretty much the same. Alright, let's circle back to Mitmap Bias. This feature can be pretty useful if you'd like a texture to favor a more or less detailed mitmap. For instance, in VR, it's often recommended to set the mitmap bias to negative 0.7. This causes textures to favor lower mitmap levels, making everything look sharper. Unity's default shaders actually do support mitmap bias, but the setting is hidden. You can set it on a per texture level using a C-sharp script like this. Unfortunately, this technique doesn't work at all on some platforms. Luckily, you can add mitmap bias support yourself by calculating the mitmap level using our good old get texture LOD function. You can access this even in a shader graph using a custom function. Whether you're writing a shader graph or an HLSL shader, remember to negate the mitmap bias before passing it to get texture LOD. For whatever reason, get texture LOD's bias argument is flipped from the mitmap bias texture setting. One more thing before I leave. You may remember that the partial derivative functions are not available during the vertex shader stage, which means that sample texture 2D is also not available. If you need to sample a texture during the vertex stage, use sample texture 2D LOD instead. You can do this, for example, to create a wind deformation shader. Grab a noise texture to act as our wind offset and create a UV from a combination of world position and time. Use a sample texture LOD node, setting the LOD level to zero. Do some more math to convert the sample into an offset and watch your model sway with the wind. Note that your noise texture doesn't need any mitmaps, so turn them off to save a few bytes. And with that, I think I'm done with mitmaps for now. I hope that you can use them to the fullest in your project. Thank you so much for watching. If you like game development, consider subscribing. I post weekly content here, and I'm currently working on a big series on grass rendering. If you liked this tutorial, I'd really appreciate it if you could like the video as well. It encourages YouTube to recommend it to others, and it really helps me out. I also really want to thank my patrons for their support, and give a big shout out to David Crew, my next gen patron. Thank you all so much. If you're interested in viewing videos early, downloading project files, or voting on future tutorial topics, consider joining my Patreon. Don't feel pressured though, I appreciate you watching it all. Thanks again for watching, and make games.